So now we'll look at how to write a triple integral in terms of spherical coordinates. For this, what we need to know is what is the volume element in spherical coordinates. So to back up a little bit, remember the idea with this triple integration was we've got a region in space and we want to integrate over that region in space of some function. So the idea was to chop up that region in space into a bunch of little tiny bits. In the case of rectangular coordinates, we were chopping it up into a bunch of rectangular boxes, tiny little boxes, and then we took a sample point in that box, plugged that into our function, and multiplied the volume of that tiny box times our function, added them up over all the boxes in the space, and then let the size of the box go to zero, or the number of boxes go to infinity, and that converted it into a triple integral. So we are integrating essentially, or sort of a generalized summing over all of the tiny little volumes times the function value at a point in that volume. So what that means is we need to know what a tiny little volume is in spherical coordinates. If I chop up my space using spherical coordinates into a bunch of tiny little spherical boxes, what is the volume of one of these spherical boxes? And so what I've got here is a sketch of our diagram of one of these tiny little spherical boxes. So this tiny spherical box we've shown here, we're imagining we've got a point, one vertex of sort of the side of this box, and we've got a few dimensions that are happening here. We've got this change in the phi direction, we've got this change in the theta direction, and we've got this change in the rho direction. And with all those changes, they make up this box, and we want to figure out what is the volume of this box. And this box is, we're imagining it's tiny. So here's what this looks like in general. We've got this blue region, which is our tiny spherical box. And let's just get a feel for what it depends on. If I change my row value, so where is this box? It depends on know what my row value is for one of the vertices, then we see that the volume really depends on rho. If we've got a small rho value, the volume is smaller. If we've got a big rho value, the volume is bigger. So it depends on our rho value. Does it depend on theta? Nope. As we spin it around, that's the same box, just at different locations. So it doesn't depend on the theta value. Does it depend on phi? Well, the smaller phi is, if we look closely at it, we can see that the box is actually quite a bit smaller when it gets close to the North Pole. But when it's near the equator, the box is bigger, and then it's smaller when I get near the South Pole. So it does depend on the phi value, the volume of this box. So it depends on rho, it depends on phi, but it also depends on the d rho, d phi, d theta, the thicknesses of, you know, the, the, the dimensions of these boxes, so, or this box. So the red planes, those are two theta planes. The separation between them is d theta. So if I shrink theta, bring those two planes closer together, the solid shrinks. So it's sort of theta thickness determines the volume of the box. But so does its phi thickness. We've got these two green cones. Those are two different phi values. The separation between them is d phi. So the volume of our box depends on that d phi thickness. And it also depends on the rho thickness as well, the separation between these two concentric spheres. So we get a feeling for what this volume depends on. Now let's go ahead and actually compute what the volume of this small little volume element is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just extract from this diagram that volume. This was that blue volume in our picture that we just went through, our, our dynamic visual. And so we've got this box that kind of looks like this. It's got a bit of some curved sides, but I'm going to draw it as a box because we're imagining it. It's, it's so, so tiny that we're going to approximate it with a rectangular box to get a feel for what the size is. And I'll start labeling these P 
pieces as we need them. Okay, so there's our box. I've just sort of drawn it out. So we've got this row thickness. I drew one purple line in here, but it's really all these purple lines are our row thickness. And so our row thickness is, we'll do something like, maybe we'll make this our row thickness. So those are our row. This is our row direction. So that's our D sub row. And maybe I'll identify our purple, or sorry, our purple, our yellow point. And then we've got our other direction. This is our, you know, as phi changes, we get this green distance there in our picture. We've got to think about what that is. That's not d phi. d phi is the separation between the angles. So this would be like our d phi. What we need to know is what is the length? So we got this d phi, it sort of sweeps out, or this, this d phi sweeps out a region. I need to know what the length is. And that length that I'm using to sweep it out is, you know, it's this length here. It's that row value that's going to sweep out that green line segment. So I have a row there, a d phi. So this length is rho d phi. And so I'll get rid of this part of the picture because it's included in that one over there. Now, what about our other direction? this blue direction. Maybe I'll draw it in like this. So in our picture, I'll go back over to our picture. I'll zoom in a little bit on it too. So we got this blue line segment. And now if I stare at this triangle, and I imagine that, you know, we got a row sine phi, and what's happening, sorry, so I shouldn't say triangle because this is a curved portion. So it's like a sector of a circle. If I imagine moving that blue line segment sweeping out over a change in d theta, then what I get is that the length of that arc there is rho sine phi, the radius, times the angle we've swept through, which is d theta. So this blue segment is rho sine phi d theta. And so I'm thinking of this tiny volume element in spherical coordinates as essentially a box that looks like this with those as its dimensions. So what is its volume? It's going to be the product of all three of these dimensions. It's rho d phi times rho sine phi d theta times d phi. And that product is precisely what's written here. There's a square on the row, there's one sine phi, and then the product of the small thicknesses, the small changes in the rho, phi, and theta. So that's our volume element. That's what dv is when we switch to a triple integral in spherical coordinates. So down below in our statement we've got a triple integral in rectangular coordinates. We change x, y, and z into our new coordinates and then dv changes to be this volume element. Rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. Let's have a look at an example. Let's find the volume and the centroid of a uniform solid that lies inside the sphere and above the cone. So sphere of radius a and the cone R equals Z. So we've got our cone we've got our sphere of radius A and we're only interested in the part that's over top of our cone so it looks something like this Oops, I'll change that to yellow because that's on our cone now we'd like to integrate over this region, and the idea is that since we're in spherical coordinates, this is a spherical box. The cone is telling us that we are trapped between two phi values. The sphere there tells us we're trapped between two row values, and the fact that we've got the whole thing uh, sort of swept out all angles theta, that theta is trapped between two values. Since r equals z, is the cone given by 
phi equals pi by 4, then the inequalities that are defining this region are the following. We have that rho is trapped between 0 and a. Phi sweeps out the values 0 to pi by 4. And theta ranges over all the values from 0 to 2 pi. And so that means that this region is a spherical box, as we've indicated. This is a spherical box. And so the integral, then, that represents the volume is just the integral over that spherical box. And we can integrate in any order um, because it's just constants for every single one of them. So we go 0 to 2 pi for our theta integral, 0 to pi by 4 for our phi integral, 0 to a for our rho integral, dv dv, because we are in spherical coordinates, is rho squared sine phi. D, and then we, the order we chose was d rho, d phi, d theta. So there's our volume integral. And we can just separate this integral as follows. It's the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta times the integral from 0 to pi by 4 of sine phi d phi and the integral from 0 to a of rho squared d rho. So very nice integral to work out because it just boils down to taking the product of three integrals of a single variable. The first integral is 2 pi. The center second integral is the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine phi. We are evaluating from 0 to pi by 4. And the last integral is 1 third rho cubed evaluated from 0 to a. So this becomes 2 pi times negative cosine of pi by 4, so that's negative 1 over root 2, plus cosine of 0, which is 1, and then 1 third a to the fourth. So this becomes 2 pi by 3 a cubed 1 minus 1 over root 2. We can clean that up a little bit. Put in that second, uh, or that last factor, 1 minus 1 over root 2, I could write that as root 2 minus 1, all over root 2. But then that root 2 in the denominator would cancel with part of the 2 to leave us just a root 2 there. So we can write this as the numerator is pi a cubed root 2, root 2 minus 1, and all of that's over 3. So there is our volume of that region. We are interested in the centroid. That was the main question. What is the centroid of this solid? And this centroid, well, since the solid's got this rotational symmetry about the z-axis, we know that for the centroid, the x center of mass and the y center of mass would both be zero due to that symmetry. So we've got both of these are zero by symmetry. We could set up the integral and verify that just to make sure, but we've got symmetry tells us this. What about the z center of mass? Well it is one over the volume and then the triple integral over the region of uh, z dv, and in this particular case that is 3 over pi a cubed root 2 root 2 minus 1. The triple integral is the same setup that we had before, 0 to 2 pi, integral from 0 to pi by 4, integral from 0 to a, but in this case we're integrating z and z is rho cos phi. And then the volume element is rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. And so this becomes, well, we've got that still the one over the volume out front. And then 
the integral. Again, we can split it up into three integrals. There's the theta integral. Notice there's no theta present in the integrand. It's just the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta. So that we get a 2 pi immediately from. Then we have the phi integral, 0 to pi by 4, of cos phi sine phi d phi. And then we also have the rho integral, which was 0 to a of rho cubed d rho. And so this becomes 3 over pi a cubed root 2, root 2 minus 1. We still have that 2 pi up top. I'll just group it with the numerator. The integral of cos phi sine phi, that's 1 half sine phi, and that's going from 0 to pi by 4, and that's, sorry, 1 half sine phi squared, or sine squared of phi. And then this last one integrates to 1 quarter a to the fourth. And this part here, maybe we'll just jot, jot down what it is in a different color so I don't have to rewrite the whole line again. So this part here is 1 half sine of pi by 4 is 1 over root 2, and that's squared, so that's times another a half. And then we plug 0 in, and that's 0. So this works out to be a quarter. And so that means that this all shakes out to be 3. Now I've got a 2 pi there. I'll just take away the 2 and cancel with one of the, the quarters, so one of those 4s in the denominator to just leave me with a 2 down there. And then the other quarter uh, from the other factor leaves me with an 8 in the denominator. So I've got an 8 overall in the denominator. I've got a pi. I've got an a cubed here, I've got a root 2, I've got a root 2 minus 1, and in the numerator I have an a to the fourth, and so this boils down to then just being the pi's cancel, so we've got 3, the a to the power 3 in the denominator cancels with a bunch in the top to leave me with just a single a up top, and I've got an 8 still in the bottom, a root 2 and a root 2 minus 1. And so there is our z coordinate of our centroid. All right, so that's it for this example. Uh, we have one more example to do in the next video, so I'll see you in the next video.